In Tennessee, just before you get to the North Carolina state line, you see Watauga Lake. This lake meanders, twists, turns, and stretches farther than most people realize. There's more to it than just the parts open to the public. Much more. Like everyone else around here, I spent my fair share of time at that lake, and, like most people, I kept my parties and good times restricted to the public part of the lake. That part was easy to access. As a child, I was in awe of the shaded park surrounding the lake. I was a little afraid of the water too. It was dark, deep, and called to me with its oddly shimmering surface. I felt that there was much danger under the dark surface. Things that couldn't be seen lurking deep under those pretty ripples. Friends and family would laugh, hoot, and run toward the water. They jumped in it, rolled in it, swam in it. Not me. And they made fun of me for it, but I wouldn't dip a toe in that dark water for fear that whatever lived under its surface would drag me down to the depths and make a meal out of me. Nope. I was going to stay right there safely on the shore. And when I was a little older, not yet a teenager, but not that same scared to death little kid either, my dad bought a pontoon boat. And I remember my mixture of excitement and fear the first time we took that boat on that lake. The logic told me that whatever I was afraid of out there couldn't sink the whole boat and kill all of us. If it did, the police would come and investigate. That could be the death of whatever ancient thing was down there, and it was too smart for that. Therefore, on the pontoon boat with my family, I was safe. We went to the lake once a week during the summers. When fall rolled around, it was a bit less frequent that we went on the water, and usually fall and spring were just cookouts and picnics on the weekends. And I loved that time with my family, and I'd grown to love the days we spent on that lake. And by the time I was a teenager, I had lost most of my fear of the water, but still hadn't found it in my heart to take the plunge, so to speak. I preferred staying on shore, stretched out, reading a book, or walking through the winding forest paths that all seemed to loop back to one parking area. In high school, I got in a group with like-minded friends. We all seemed to do good in high school, and I found my place among my peers. During the summer of my junior year, we stayed at the lake more than we stayed at our homes. It was an amazing summer. We experienced so many rites of passage that year and all of us bonded together. I knew I'd made lifelong friends with that little group and I couldn't have been happier. One of the biggest and most important experiences I had that summer for my own personal growth was learning to get in the water. I could swim. I'd been swimming in ponds and rivers and swimming pools my whole life. It was just what took a lake that I was afraid of for some reason. And with the help of my best friend, I learned to go into Watuga Lake with far less fear. Not all of it disappeared, but I learned how to deal with that paralyzing fear enough that it could at least interact with my friends without looking so much like a misfit. And now, falling in love seemed to be one of the rites that we all went through as well. That summer, I met my future wife. She didn't know it at the time, but I kind of did. Her name was Terry, and she had only just transferred from a neighboring school when her father took a job in our town. She was the most beautiful girl I'd ever met, and my usual quick wit flew out the window when she was near me. I became clumsy and tongue-tied, and the harder I fought against the feeling, the worse the symptoms became. Now, Terry loved the lake and told us she had been coming to the lake since she was a small child, just like the rest of us. Oddly, we had all met each other at one time or another when we were little, but none of us could ever remember meeting Terry or anyone in her family. Not that it bothered me, I just thought it was a strange coincidence. Maybe she and her family just visited different places on the lake, or they visited at different times than the rest of us. 
And as I mentioned, the lake is truly expansive, and there are miles and miles of trail leading around it. It's quite possible that we never saw Terry because her family visited the lakeside trails and the parks that were deeper in the woods. My group were what the old folks called water dogs, always at the water's edge or out on the boats and jet skis, except for me. I was on the shore and on the pontoon boat, but never in the water. That is, not until my junior year of high school. After Terry joined our little group, I really wanted to impress her. She didn't seem interested in any of the guys, including me. Not romantically, anyway. She laughed and ran the trails with us, rode on the boats, and even camped overnight the few times our parents allowed us to stay on chaperone. Now on one of these overnight camping trips, we all started telling ghost stories around the little fire pit. And I'm not sure how it all got started, but it did. And again, wanting to impress Terry, I made up a story and joined in. My tale was by far the scariest, had the most detail. And knowing it was bullshit didn't stop it from creeping me out almost as much as it had the others in the group. But when it was Terry's turn to share a story, she sat quietly for a long moment, as if contemplating her tale. And at the urging of the others, she smiled and nodded. I was happy to sit by and watch the way the firelight danced over her tanned skin, giving her natural highlights that should have been captured in a photo or a painting. She could have sat there all night, staring into the fire and never saying a word, and I would have happily sat there watching her. She was soft-spoken, so we all had to listen a bit closer to catch all the details of her story, but it was worth it. She told us about a place far up the river near the North Carolina border where the lake disappears into a dark pine tree cove. She said she had visited there several times with her mom and dad when she was very small. There was a little cabin set far back out of sight in that little cove, and she described it in such loving detail that it came to life in my mind, and I could see the open room of the downstairs with the central fireplace open on both sides, the stone chimney rising through the second floor. She said her great-grandfather had built it when he was 19, so he and his new bride would have a place to vacation in the summer. His wife apparently didn't enjoy camping on the shore in a tent. She preferred walls, roof, and a bed. And now at this point, Valerie stopped her mid-story to question about the little cabin, saying that she had traveled up and down the lake and had never seen such a place. And Terry only said that no one would see it unless they knew where to look. There was moss on part of the exterior, vines on the rest of it, and trees blocking the view. The cabin was camouflaged very well, Terry said. But Terry went on to explain that the cabin had been passed to her mother as a wedding present. And that one day, it was supposed to be hers. She shared so many fond memories of staying there painted such a beautiful picture of this idyllic life by the lake that I wondered if that's where she grew up. Had she and her family lived there for an extended time? I finally asked her, and she said that they had spent as much time at the cabin as they had at their actual house, so it was hard to say whether she actually lived there or not. We all exchanged looks, each of us confused by her odd answer. And then it hit me. That was just all part of the build-up in the story she was telling, which was supposed to be scary, but so far had not been. She was filling us with a false sense of security. Yeah, that had to be it. I grinned, feeling superior to my still-confused group of friends. She said that her family stopped going to the cabin last year, and, well, it made her sad. And then she smiled looked around at each of us as if coming out of a daze, raised her hands, and said that was it. That was her story. Now Valerie protested that it was supposed to be scary. And Terry said, 
Well, there's a ghost up there. I could take you all up there some night and show you. Her smile dropped, and she got that faraway look in her eyes again. Travis laughed and nudged Kira. Let's do it. I don't believe her. Valerie looked across the fire at me and gave me a questioning look. I shrugged. I didn't really want to go wandering around the woods after dark. There were far too many dangers and none of us were prepared for such an adventure. Terry looked at me. Well, do you want me to show you the ghost? It's a once in a lifetime experience. Something in her demeanor made my skin shrink and break out in hives. I don't think it's a good idea, Terry. Uh, maybe another day when we could get there safely. Okay? Now, that ended the conversation about the adventure. And though I was again being made fun of for not doing something that everyone else was willing to do, I stuck to my guns and I refused. I told them that if they left... I would call parents and be a snitch. Just something didn't feel right about it. And I wasn't going to allow anyone to get hurt that night. It was high summer, and the group had been riding my ass about the trip to the cabin. Valerie had even taken it upon herself to try to find the place a couple of times. She had no luck, and began to dislike Terry a bit. She said she didn't trust her after all that. I told Valerie that my story had been complete fabricated lies, and so had the others that night. So why shouldn't Terry's story be a lie? And Valerie said it was because Terry never did or said anything to make us think it was anything other than real. She even wanted to take us there. So finally, one Friday, we all decided to go camping at the lake and we were without adult chaperones again. We had all told our parents that we were at friends' houses spending the night, and none of them would bother to check out our stories. We had been spending the night with one another for years now. I mean, I felt really bad about lying to my parents, but this was the evening we were supposed to go find the cabin and go see the supposed ghost. Late that evening... We all got into my car and drove up to the winding mountain road towards North Carolina. Terry pointed out a place to park the car and pointed across the lake. She said the cabin was just across the lake. We all looked but couldn't see any sign of a cabin. And dusk was moving in fast. Terry led us down to a small rowboat and I paddled us across as fast as I could. On the other side, we stepped onto a white sandy beach. It was the same as everywhere else on the lake except the sand was whiter. I don't know, cleaner looking. And we followed Terry around a sharp bend on the beach and into the little cove. It was darker there and we had to use our flashlights. We walked in silence. I suspect each of us harboring a little fear in our hearts as Terry led us fearlessly towards the unknown. The cabin finally came into view, but only when we were close enough to toss a rock and hit it. Nature had indeed camouflaged the structure very well. As we stepped closer, Valerie, Travis, Kira, and I stopped. Something was wrong. Terry kept walking toward a little side door. She turned, still smiling, and motioned us to follow. Come on, the ghost is in here. You do want to see it, right? The sun had dropped farther, and the sky was going black. The darkness in the little cove swept over us quickly. Travis and Kira moved to Terry's side, and Valerie and I stood where we were, just still unsure. Travis called us chicken and told Terry to show him and Kira the ghost. He walked back at me and said, When we're done, maybe you two chickens will feel safe enough to come in. <laughs> he laughed and disappeared inside. I stood so that I could follow the progress of their flashlight beams. The interior of the cabin looked like the outside. There were vines all over the walls, fallen leaves and other debris along the floor. 
and a small tree growing out of the fireplace. I pointed all this out to Valerie, and we stepped quietly closer to the doorway. And inside, there was nothing of the idyllic cabin Terry had told us about. I mean, it looked close to collapse. It wasn't safe for them to be running around in. Valerie said, I told you there was something wrong with her story. What if she's some crazy serial killer or something? Valerie, Terry isn't a serial killer. Don't be stupid. She's just doing this to scare us and become a solid member of the group, that's all. But I wasn't too sure about that, though. I mean, I did hope for it. I love Terry, even if she didn't feel the same about me. At the time, I was convinced she would feel that way about me. I could change her mind eventually. We had moved to the door frame, and I shone my light around. It was dark, just too dark. And where had Travis and Kira gone? And I yelled for Travis, but got no answer. I yelled for Kira, and got no answer. The door across the large open room was still shut, and the leaves on the floor were undisturbed. No one had left the house. After five minutes of waiting in near silence, I decided they weren't just planning a jump scare. Something might actually be wrong. Valerie wouldn't come in with me, and I had to go inside and find my friends. Now the downstairs was completely empty. There was nowhere for anyone to hide. The furniture had long since been removed. There was only a coffee table and a lamp table left down there. And upstairs, I saw three doors. Probably bedrooms on the left side. And on the right, there was just another big, wide open space, with a chimney jutting up through it. The open area was empty as the downstairs, that left only the three rooms with closed doors. I mean, where else could they be? I had to try three times before my voice held out enough force to call for Travis and Kira. I got no answers, not even the creak of a floorboard to signal their whereabouts. I had to open the doors. And that was the scariest thing I ever did in my life. The first door let into an empty room. No furniture, no closet, no people. I breathed a sigh of relief as I moved out of that door and on to the next. Now at this point, every horror movie scenario you can imagine ran through my head as I reached for the second doorknob. And that room was empty, except for a dresser that had no drawers in it. The third room was by far the hardest for me to enter. I stood at the door, listening, for a long time. I heard no noise at all that suggested that they were in there. But they had to be. There was nowhere else they could be. And hoping that they were playing an elaborate trick on me, I slowly turned the knob and let the door drip inward as I stepped back, sweeping the beam of my light back and forth across the room. There was a bed in that room and an open closet door. I gasped as my light hit the bed, and I realized... Someone was under the cover. I stepped inside so I could see inside the open closet. Travis and Kira sat in there, huddled together, not speaking, not looking at me. And I looked back to the bed. Guys, what is this? I whispered as I searched the closet for Terry. The thing in the bed looked like a large Halloween doll with its hollowed cheeks and ratty hair, its withered and dried out arms and hands placed on top of the covers. Kira turned to me, and the terror in her eyes affected me, made my stomach clench. She stabbed the finger toward the bed, swallowing hard. I turned to the bed. Had Terry somehow used the prop to scare Travis and Kira so badly that they wouldn't come out of the closet? I moved toward the bed, my beam trained on the prop. And to my right, Terry jumped through the doorway and yelled. Behind me, Travis and Kira broke into laughter. 
They had tricked me. Travis and Kira ran past me laughing like idiots, and I cursed at them as they left the room. And Terry said, So, what do you think? She walked to the bed. Holy crap, that was a lot of work just to get me alone. I mean, that's what had to be what this was about. She just wanted me to get alone so that we could talk. Smiling, I stood beside her, not very interested in the prop doll anymore. But where's the ghost you promised? She flipped back the cover on the bed, revealing the whole prop. The clothes looked similar. Terry was wearing the same clothes. Ugh, clever. He's dressed as twinsies, I laughed, feeling a bit scared again. You saw two ghosts already. You didn't even know it. While I stood confused, she reached and pointed my light down to the prop on the bed. You're looking at a third now. The prop doll look a lot like Terry. Too much like her. It unnerved me and I moved back. My foot caught on a floorboard and I sprawled, my light skittering up under the bed. And there were two bodies there. Travis and Kira's. And I screamed and vaulted for the door. Valerie was on her way inside as I was going out, and I hit her we both tumbled to the floor. She saw under the bed and began to scream. Terry came at us with a knife raised high. I finally fit in somewhere, and I want to keep my friends with me always. Please don't make this harder than it has to be. The knife arced down, and Valerie and I were running for the stairs. We tumbled at the fireplace, and Valerie stood with a poker, posed in a batter's position. As Terry charged her, Valerie swung, and the poker went through Terry scattering her halves like smoke and ashes in two directions. I spent a lot of time in a padded room after that. So did Valerie. She still doesn't talk. I talk, but not a lot. I'm just trying this writing thing to try to clear my head of some of these things. It's not every day that you fall in love with a ghost. It's also not every day that the love of your life kills two of your best friends, either. The cops arrested Valerie and I. We were the only two living people there. The girl in the bed wasn't a Halloween prop. It was indeed Terry. She'd apparently taken an overdose of sleeping pills and gone to bed there when she was 23. And after she had learned the death of her parents... She'd been an odd girl in life, never really had a lot of friends, and had no family.